Author's Shelf. The Author's Shelf. The Author's Shelf. Good afternoon, I'm Georgie Donahay and welcome to another special edition of The Author's Shelf. Now, are you ready? She's back. Jackie French is back with us today on The Author's Shelf. Jackie had such a good time when she joined us in February, she couldn't wait to come back and we couldn't wait to have her back either. Well, for the next hour, she's all ours. So sit back and relax as I bring you the stories beyond the page. You're listening to The Author's Shelf on 2SSR 99.7 FM, Sound of the Sutherland Shire. And coming up next... Jackie French returns to the author's shelf. The biggest variety in Sydney. Two double SR. FM 99.7. Now it's time to reintroduce today's guest. Jackie French is the best selling author of over 140 books, including the iconic Diary of a Wombat and Hitler's Daughter. Her writing career spans over 25 years. Sorry. Yes. Her writing career spans over 25 years and her books have been translated into 36 different languages. She's won over 60 awards in Australia and overseas. In fact, she's one of the few writers to have won both literary and children's choice awards. Diary of a Wombat is loved the world over and has been on the bestseller list lists across the world. Jackie is committed to both the environment and wildlife conservation. She's also a strong advocate for the rights of children with learning difficulties. In November last year, Jackie was announced as the Australian Children's Laureate for 2015. Jackie joined us in February this year and her interview is still being talked about. If you didn't catch our first interview with Jackie, you can listen to it commercial free on our podcast on soundcloud.com hash creative dash kids dash tales. Now, Jackie French, welcome to the author's shelf. Welcome back to the author's shelf. Lovely to be back. Thank you. Tell us, Jackie, what have you been up to since we last spoke in February? Um, I've written what I think is by far the best book of my life. Just sometimes you write a book and It all comes together. You know, I've spent 25 years telling people inspiration doesn't exist. A story doesn't suddenly come spearing through the universe and land in your head and then you put it on the page. And after 25 years of saying that doesn't happen, suddenly it happened to me and in three weeks I wrote 200,000 words. Wow. And I can't quite believe that I'm the person who actually wrote that book. So I did that for three weeks and I've also been racing around as children's laureate which has been even busier than I thought it was. So I've been to Sydney many times. I've been to Melbourne. I've been to Fremantle. I've been to Perth. Um, I've probably been to other places, but I've sort of lost count. Um, <laughs> I think I've spoken to about 12,000 kids um, literally in, in about the last three weeks and done, um, I think, about 28 or 32 or something like that articles and interviews. So it, it's been it's been a lot, and also last Saturday I went to the opening of um, Pete the Sheep the musical. Oh, lovely! Yes, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that later in the yep. show. Um, okay, so you really haven't been doing much since February. Really. No, 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 just no, sort no, of not, not sitting back, much. putting no. your feet up, having the wombats run around. Yes. Sure, okay. Oh yeah, and and look, feed, feeding the wombats, um, training the pumpkin vine, which has suddenly decided to grow and is growing. I'm not kidding, about two meters a day, and is starting to wander through our bedroom. Um, yes, yeah, so then a few other things. Okay, as well. what, yeah. what are you feeding your plants there, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> it's rain. Oh, it's lovely, it isn't it? Yeah, it didn't. It was so dry over over um, January and part of February, and everything was turning brown. And I think it's all of those accumulated wombat droppings and other things that suddenly, um, suddenly it's got rain and it's it's not as hot, and everything is just growing absolutely wild and the wombats were getting a bit thin and the wallabies were, were looking distinctly hungry and eating things they usually didn't like eating um, but now they've got plenty of roses to eat and grass and all sorts of things that wallabies really like best so they're, they've, they've got tummies sort of poke, poking out like watermelons and looking, uh, looking very happy I and thought, very fluffy. I thought you were going to say that the pumpkin vine might be in danger now of, well, of being it, eaten. It was in danger when there wasn't much to eat, and wallabies really don't like eating pumpkin vines. Oh, okay. But now, no, they're, they're just eating rose shoots and green grass, and 
Yes, and a few apple shoots and the things that wallabies really do like best. And, and apples. They're very fond of apples. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Now, can you tell us anything about this this book that you've written or you can't say anything yet? Um, no, let's, let's leave it. It's, okay. um, it's not coming out till the end of the year and I've okay. got to rewrite it and rewrite it in the way in the way that you normally do. But it's the fourth in the Wolf for Matilda series. So there was a Wolf for Matilda, the girl from Star oh, River, okay. Road to Gundagai, and this is... This is book four. Um, okay, brilliant. So it's a y- yeah. it's a YA book. Well, I thought it was, okay. except um, the publishers have decided to put out an adult edition this oh, December, okay. and they'll put out the YA edition early next year. Oh, okay, interesting. So they're they're a bit excited about it. Actually, what am I saying? Actually, they're very excited about it, and I'm. Um, yeah, it's just sometimes you think I I couldn't have written that. I, I really could not have written that. How did I write that? You go back at it and you think, did I really write that? No, I'm, I, I've, I've, I've honestly got almost no feeling that I did write it, and yet in a really funny way, I've been writing it all my life. It's it's set in World War Two, and I grew up after World War Two, and it's made up of all of the stories um, of the adults around me um, talking about their lives in World War Two. That that incredible time when Australia was threatened with invasion, um, when we, we really had to fight to keep the invader from our shores. Um, and it's the only time in Australia's history where, where that's happened. And as my mum said, um, the year she had to carry her gas mask with her everywhere, um, everywhere you went, um, 24 hours a day, by your bed if you went anywhere, you had to carry your gas mask with you because because of the, um, of the fear of invasion. Um, it's a very long time ago now, and a very different Australia. Mm. But that's, but I think the emotions in it, um, it's it's about different ways of of governing a country, completely different people, and completely different ways of governing a country, and how you do it, and, and what you do then. Well, that sounds very exciting. I know I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I can't wait. So that's the end of the year, is it? It's the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, yeah. All okay. right. So you talked you talked about you how you've been speaking with thousands of children since you've uh, taken over the Australian Ch- Children's Laureate role. You've so you've settled in, you'd say. I think I'm settling in. Um, however, if you ask me that um, in a year's time, I might say that oh, I had no idea what I was doing way back then. But um, look, I think I think I know what I am doing finally and what people want. And one of the projects I've got, in fact, if anyone wants to to write into the Laureate office. Um, one project is next year, it's 2015 by the Children of Australia and it's 365 diaries of a day in 2015. So if anyone listening wants to be one of the kids, um, anyone from 0 to 18 who wants to write a diary for one of the days next year, every day will be written by someone else. It can be as long as you like or as short. So if the day you choose, you wake up and you've got the flu, you can just write, got the flu, went back to bed, <laughs> and that's all you have to write. Otherwise, you can write about anything you want to, but you just write your diary for the day. So if you choose the 3rd of January, 2015, you write a diary for that day, and then you guarantee that within the next couple of days, you'll send the diary to the Gorrett office. And we'll put it all together so that it will be a book, so that in 10 years, 50 years or 100 years, people can look at it and say, that's what Australia was like in 2015 if you were a kid in Australia then. That's what mattered to the kids of Australia. So you write about whatever matters to you. It can be your annoying um, younger brother. Um, It can be about politicians. It can be about your school. It can be about your breakfast or about your dog. Um, or your favourite TV program. It really doesn't matter. Whatever interests you and was important for you on that day. So if you would like to be part of this and if you would like to write a day and have it published in this book, um, send send your day to the Laureate office and we will give you a day next year that you can write your diary. That's fantastic. So you need 365 children from around the country to participate exactly. in this. Yes, to, to give us a diary of their day. Excellent. Okay, all right. Well, we'll put the call out there. I'll, we'll put it on Creative Kids Tales and we'll get 365 children <laughs> happening. And I think I have one, one little person who has spoken to you when she was at school doing the video link up before who will be jumping up and down at home going, me, 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 as she's listening to this. So... 
I think you only need 364 now, Jackie. Right. Okay. Okay. So I think she'll be probably beating down the laureate's door tomorrow at the, the office door. Sorry, saying me, 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 me. Okay. And she can. Okay. When well, this that case, she can get in early to choose the day that she wants to write. Okay. Which could be her birthday. Well, imagine that 365 days featured and they're all birthdays. Wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll put the call out there. So, yes, as Jackie said, anyone listening, we'll have some details. Um, we'll, we'll get them up on the Creative Kids Tales website so you know exactly who you have to contact and what you have to do. Now, um, you're writing. You've been writing for over 25 years. Have you taken long service leave yet? No. Okay. No. I was – funny, I'm just writing a story um, this morning for – it's a, it's a publication to raise money for the Melbourne Children's Hospital. And it's about a family taking a holiday. And I was actually just thinking as I was writing about it, it's called The Ghost Motel. Um, I was writing this and thinking, um, hey, wait a minute, it's been a really long time since I had a holiday. I can't really remember when. But look, on the other hand, I get to spend my days doing exactly what I love. Um, either um, mooching about the garden or the bush and tracking animals or, or writing stories. And I really can't think of anything better than that. Maybe after 2015. Maybe after 2015. But even then, I think my idea of a holiday is doing more of the work that I got of a different sort that I haven't had time to rather than... So after 2015, I'll definitely be doing much less talking <laughs> and, and probably much more writing and much more mooching. Um, but no, I don't think there'll be a holiday of that sort. Do you ever get tired of, of your job? No, because... There's enormous freedom. Um, I'm, I'm really free to write about the things that I love and I'm excited in and I'm really fascinated in. And every day there's something new. Yesterday, um, and, um, the Hairy Nose Wombat found a new home arrived, which is, um, it's a picture book with Sue de Janeiro, which is coming out in a couple of weeks. And it's all about that wonderful good news story. Because look, in the 1980s, there were only 35 um, Northern Hairy Nose Wombats in the world. And then volunteers got together, raised the money to put fences around to keep out foxes and um, and wild cats and put in water stations, feeding stations. And suddenly the wombats started to do what wombats like to do, which is eat grass, dig holes and have baby wombats. And in the last census, there's more than 200. So but without any major scientific intervention or anything, just by protecting where they live, We've been able to save the northern hairy nose wombat, and now there's two homes for hairy nose wombats, and they're looking for a third because there's starting to be so many northern hairy noses. So every day there is something new and something exciting, and Sue's illustrations for that book are just so funny and so gorgeous. And every wombat is dressed in, because Sue does collage, and she dresses the wombats in clothes made of things like um, patty cake papers and things like that. Oh, lovely. Oh, and as she said, dressing dressing um, 138 wombats um, took a lot more time than she thought. Yes, I imagine it would. When's that book out? Um, it should come out on the 1st of May. And we've also got um, Hairy Nose Day, which is on the 11th of May. And on National Hairy Nose Day, you wear whiskers for wombats or whiskers for wild rice, and you um, raise money for endangered any furry endangered creature. Oh, excellent. So if any, yes, so if you want to find out about that, you can go to the um, Wombat Foundation website and that will teach you how to make your own whiskers to wear at school. Oh, wonderful. Okay, all right. Have you Now, listen, have you ever thought, if, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what mm -hmm. other profession do you think that you would have chosen? Well, I would probably, what I was doing when I first sent my first book off, I was farming. But the problem was that there was a drought and um, I had a young baby and I really wasn't earning enough money to register the car. So I still live on the farm and we still have got more than 800 trees, but it's a lot easier to make a living as a writer than it is farming. And every time there's a drought or... At the moment, it's been raining every day for, I think, the last 11 days. Oh, lovely. And, well, it's, it's lovely and it's lovely to write about and use that as a background to the next story. But... I wouldn't want to be farming in it. No. Very, I would have to be out in the rain every day instead of tucked up nice and warm inside looking at the rain coming down out the windows. And in droughts too, um, there, there was no grass. 
So, yes, I might still be a farmer, but I'm not, I really started, as I said, sending my books away to make money because it was so hard to make money as a farmer. Well, um, we're glad that she found that typewriter with the, the missing A, I think it was, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd been writing stories ever since I was six. It was just I'd never sent any to a publisher. So I can't, I can't ever see myself not writing stories. I can see myself doing something else, but I'd always be writing stories too, even if I didn't ever send them to a publisher. I think we'd miss you too much, Jackie. How do, okay, how do you map out your stories? Now, I'll give you an example. Now, yeah. when I'm mapping out my stories or plotting, my listeners probably aren't going to want to hear this, but I do a lot of it in the shower. Uh, I know it might sound strange, but with three young children, the shower is about one of the only places where I get total peace and quiet. Um, once I've got the story mapped out in my head, I then sit down and write it. And Now, until I've worked it through, I can't put pen to paper. What's your style? You know, it's amazing how many writers say they get ideas in the shower. I don't think it's just being by yourself. I think oh, okay. it's something about water. Okay. And um, Tim Winton says um, surfing for him. And other writers I know say, look, I'm swimming at the beach. Um, and for me, down in the in this swimming hole in the creek, I think there is something about water as an idea. And also going for a walk, I find works, and also music. I get a lot of um, ideas just come to me listening to music. But... Um, for me, it's almost as though I can see it like it's a movie in my mind. And until it is a movie in my mind and I can really see it and I'm just putting down on paper what I can see and I know the beginning and the middle and the end, until that movie has played itself in my mind, I don't start writing. But because you keep thinking when you are writing, um, the movie changes. So the story that I've thought of is never the story that comes out on the page. Um, it always grows and changes as you write it, which is a good thing because otherwise it'd be really, really boring, like um, watching a movie for the 60th time. So in one way, I never sit down until I know exactly what I'm writing about and um, how it will end and, and, and why I'm writing it. But every time I sit down to write, um, it's always a very, very different book that, that emerges at the end. Thank you for that, sharing that with us. All right. And on that note, you mentioned music. We can get inspiration from music. <laughs> We're going to, we ha I have to play a couple of songs. I'm sorry. I, I'd love to keep chatting, but I'll, I'll promise I'll play a very short one. Two double SR, supporting Australian talent. You're listening to The Author's Shelf. I'm chatting this afternoon with Jackie French. Jackie, on our last show, we discussed the importance of reading to young children. Now, sadly, the role of teacher librarians is becoming extinct in many schools across the country. How important are teacher librarians in our primary schools, especially? They're the heart of the school. Absolutely good for me. Um, every other teacher has got the subjects, the classes, etc. But the teacher librarian sees everyone in a school. And the teacher librarian, too, is surrounded by ideas. Um, just by being and living in that library, they are surrounded by a world of ideas and they can match the right universe and the right books to the right kid. And it's, it's what I call the magic book. The magic book is the book that turned kids into readers. Um, with any kid who doesn't like reading, um, the way to turn them into a reader is to find that magic book, the one where they realize this is the sort of books I like, um, suddenly finding out what that extraordinary experience is of actually finding yourself in the perfect universe of the perfect book. And the teacher librarian is often the only person who can do that because they know what is available, they know what is around, and they know the right questions to ask kids. But also, because teacher librarians do give in that world of ideas and books and just infinite possibilities with all the books around them whispering, read me, read me, guess what's happening here, guess what's happening around the corner, they're also often the people who arrange special things in the school. They're the ones who arrange to have um, authors come to visit. They're the ones who arrange all sorts of workshops. They're the ones who just have extraordinary ideas for competitions. Um, they're often the ones who make other teachers enthusiastic so that when a teacher might become really, really tired because, let's face it, teaching is absolutely an exhausting job, um, the 
teaching librarians are often the ones that really inspire other teachers to think, look, we really are changing lives here. We really are creating futures for the kids in this school. And even if the kids don't realise it, even if no one says thank you, what we are doing is the most powerful job in the world. Um, and we're going to think of new ways of doing it more wonderfully. And in school after school after school, it's the teacher librarian who brings together the ideas and the possibilities and the people and who puts that real spark of joy and enthusiasm into the school. And I suppose it's very difficult to put that actually on a balance sheet and it's why um, so many people may not realise just how extraordinarily important the teacher librarian is. Um, Schoolwork is essential, but the main job of a school is to spark that love of learning and reading that will last for um, a kid's entire lifetime. And that's the role of the teacher librarian, not just this year's syllabus, um, but to really spark the love of, okay, where do I go from here? And there is no one, absolutely nothing, that can replace the job of a teacher librarian. What do you think we can do to change this and get teacher librarians back? First of all, find out if your school has got a teacher librarian. Um, if your school does have a teacher librarian, um, write letters saying how wonderful they are and possibly the odd bunch of flowers or even actually the odd cake does not go on this, particularly when the cake can actually be shared out with everyone at morning tea. Um, if your school is doing a wonderful job, remember remember to thank them. And the cake is a good way of doing it, or, or a box of apples or apricots or something like that. If your school doesn't have a teacher librarian, um, ask the head of the school why not and talk to them about how important it is. Um, if they don't have the funds, work out how to get the funds. If they want a teacher librarian but they are stymied by school rules, Work out, just keep going up the chain um, all the way through the school authorities to the Minister for Education, if necessary, saying our kids deserve a teacher librarian because without them, um, we are missing the magic in, in education. Excellent. All right, everyone, on to the principals tomorrow. Go straight for the top at the school already and see if your school has a teacher librarian. And if not start taking some action but if they do if they do yes if they do make sure that everyone knows how much you value them so that their job isn't at risk so do remember those cakes do remember the letter to the principal um even a letter to the paper when they do something extraordinary in book week because teachers librarians always do something extraordinary in book week and probably extraordinary things at other times of the year too so it's also really important to publicize um, what teacher librarians do. So when your local teacher librarian or children's librarian at the local library does something wonderful, make sure it gets into the local paper. Um, make sure that people know the wonderful things they do because otherwise people don't realise um, the astounding job they do do. Absolutely. Now, I know, Jackie, you're not particularly fond of the term reluctant reader. So what would you suggest to a parent who has a child who is, let's say, book shy? <laughs> is that better? <laughs> yes, okay. okay. Um, well, look, I think reluctant is probably fair enough. Um, I was talking to um, kids last week and I asked, put up your hands, those who don't like reading, and they all looked at the teacher and, um, and looked really embarrassed and they put their hand up. And I said, okay, um, the teacher shut your eyes, put your hand up. And so they did. Um, most of them were boys. And I said, okay, um, who of the reluctant readers likes watching um, Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones? And again, they looked at the teacher because after all, these are for adults and they shouldn't be watching it. And again, the teacher shut their eyes and almost the same kids put their hands up. And I said, look, do you realise these are books? Um, a lot of kids don't realise that they may not like the books that their parents or their teachers like. Because after all, teachers are very social people and like probably like you and me, we like books where people talk about things and sit down and talk about things. But um, a lot of kids like books where there's a lot more action and a lot less talking. And they may not be the books that are necessarily recommended at school. So kids need to be given a really wide choice, just as adults do. And that does need to include um, action books um, where people don't talk. But particularly... 
um, remember that often, look, it's very easy when you turn on the TV to get the story because it's all there sort of predigested for you, like baby food. You just have to watch it. But often kids' reading skills aren't good enough to read the sorts of books that they would really find exciting. They can read, but they still might find it difficult to, say, read a book like Lord of the Rings, which they would love. So even when your kids are 7, 8, 12 and 15, um, still read to them um, or, for that matter, get them to read to you because you may find that their appetite is for books that are more advanced, like probably not more advanced than they can read. They probably can read them, but they may not realise they can read them until after you've read a chapter to them. So it's so important, particularly as your kids get older, to keep reading to them. Um, not necessarily the whole book, but find a really challenging, wonderful book, like Black Lord of the Rings or actually John Marston's Tomorrow When the War Began. There are so many fantastic books. And just read a chapter and see if they think that is their magic book. Um, once you've read a chapter, it's easier for a kid to read the rest of the book because you've already read the proper names um, you've already read um, any challenging words that might be in it, like Stegosaurus um, or Velociraptor, so it's easy It's easy to read after that. But it also has given them a taste of a book, just like tasting a new food, and they'll know whether they want to continue. So always have at least six very different books on hand, and always, every day, read them a chapter of a book and see if they want to finish reading that book themselves. Or if they feel that it's still too hard for them to read, be prepared to read them a chapter every day of the book. Um, we underestimate, I think, often um, the sort of books that appeal to kids. Um, we give them very short, funny books, which is all very nice. There's a really big place for short, funny books. I just had a slice of watermelon. Um, and that's the equivalent of a short, funny book. But it doesn't replace um, having having a proper meal. And it's the same with books. Kids need more than the short, funny books that they find easy to read. And the best way for them to get that, and often the only way for them to get that, is having parents who are prepared to read them at least a chapter and possibly the whole of a really long, complex book. And the better and the richer the book, the better and the richer the experience kids are going to have. There's a reason why some books live for decade after decade after decade. Um, books which have which people keep on reading, which become known as classics, they're classics for a reason. Um, that's because they move us. It's because we really want to be part of them. And those are the books that kids need too, as well as the short, funny ones. And as I said, often the only way kids will get them is if parents are prepared to sit down and breed them um, a good hunk of a really challenging, beautiful, fantastic, exciting, thrilling, or whatever your kid thinks they want, whatever sort of book um, is going to be the magic book for them. Thank you. Just now, that brings me to my next question. I'm often asked by parents, should children only read books designed for their age? Can allowing them to read books, say, a couple of years above the, the age intended, can it be bad for their learning process? I know with my children, if they're able to read the first few pages of a book and understand what they've read, and of course the book is child-friendly, I'm happy for them to read it. So every child progresses differently, and I think to say that they can't read a book aimed at perhaps a 10-year-old when they're only seven is a deterrent rather than encouraging. Oh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've never, I'm never sure what the term was um, I bridled, but I'm sitting here bridling, whatever that means. Um, I've never heard anything as crazy in my life. I, I get that asked all the time, though. Like, um, it's, it's, it's really weird. I mean, we've had teachers we, say we don't We don't have food that's just for kids. I mean, as soon as kids have teeth... They're expected to eat anything. And if you only give gave kids baby food, they don't ever want to eat baby food. Um, with TV, yes, there are a few shows, which are definitely adults only. There are a few shows, um, which are really just for very, very little kids. But for most kids, once a kid is eating the same food as an adult, then they should read the sort of book that they feel like reading. Now, 
there are books with what we may call adult themes. And it's not just that kids shouldn't read these. They're not going to want to read these because it is about adult experiences that they won't relate to. But there are a lot of books for adults that kids even as young as 7 or 10 are going to like reading adult books. I certainly did as a child. But in the same thing too, there are a lot of books which are ostensibly kids' books that adults also are going to read. And there are so many books like the classics, and look, I'll, I'll go back to um, John Marston's books or Lord of the Rings or what have you. Um, they are not books for any age or Norman Lindsay's Magic Pudding for that matter. Um, it's a funny book, it's a short book, but it's not a book just for kids. Um, most books, um, I don't think, in fact, I think most good books are not age-specific. Most good books appeal to anyone. And if a kid's book doesn't appeal to adults too, it probably is not a classic and a good book. Um, and most books written for adults will also appeal to kids certainly as young as 10 and possibly as young as 7. And just as most of the programs we see on TV are for any age group. That's the same with a good book. And if a kid doesn't understand one word in six, um, it doesn't matter. If the book is good enough and fascinating enough, um, the kids will force themselves. So they'll skip over that word and they'll still be able to understand what's happening. They may not be able to read the book aloud because they can't pronounce it, but it's quite easy to read a book and just skip over the words you don't understand and you'll still get the meaning and you'll still work out what's happening. And once a kid reads that word like velociraptor, velociraptor six times, they're going to know what velociraptor means. And that's how kids acquire language. But there's no way on earth that we can say this book is suitable for a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, or a 12-year-old. It just doesn't work that way. It's a very, very dangerous concept. On the other hand, though, we can say this is a book that an early reader will be able to read by themselves. This is a book that um, a slightly older reader can read by themselves. But we always need to really be very clear that there's two quite different things. One are the books that are teaching kids to read and we are going to expect them to read aloud so we can know that they're actually learning how to read these words. But that's, that's an educational tool. Um, they're not the books that you read for the sheer joy of pleasure, but also are an even deeper education. They're the education that's teaching you empathy and creativity, how other people think, um, are build, literally building up the intelligence in your brain. And they're, those are quite different books. So we've got the how-to books, and yes, you'll progress very carefully with those and not give a kid anything that's too challenging, expect them to read it aloud, or they'll get discouraged. But on the other hand, we've got the books that they are going to love. And they're probably not the educational ones. And the books they love, as I said before, if they're too difficult for a child to read themselves, then it's the adult's job to read that book to them until they can read it themselves. Otherwise, we're starving our kids. We're giving them the equivalent of baby food um, Well, until they're, until they're old enough to go and get the books themselves. And if we do that, they're never, ever going to mature into fantastic readers, just as a kid fed on pureed baby food and, and potato and pears mixed together is never going to grow into an adult who will really um, be strong and healthy and appreciate good food. Thank you for that. I'm going to refer everyone who asked me that question back to what you've just said because I, I totally agree with you. I think as long as the children um, are, are happy with it, they want to read it and, and they show that they understand that they can what they're reading then there shouldn't be any reason why they shouldn't read it and as you said if there is a problem and they have a little trouble with it then parents should step in or carers or somebody an adult should step in and help you think look there there are subjects which are going to be emotionally difficult for kids there are certainly adult themes so as i said kids won't be interested in those mm. there are other books that just like tv shows need adult guidance they're ones where very unhappy things happen. But um, a loving parent will know if a kid is troubled by what they're reading mm. because their faces will be troubled when they're reading it. 
Um, I should also add the proviso there that I think the book you read before you go to bed should always be an old favourite yes. that you know you know because kids, um, you don't want kids to get nightmares no. and even um, any new book, um, well, look, you don't want a new book when you go to bed because then even if it's the most wonderful book in the world, you might be up till 4 a.m. wanting to finish it. Mm. So with the proviso there, the book you read before you go to bed should always be one you've read before and it's an old comfortable favourite, so it's going to give you wonderful dreams. You're listening to The Author's Shelf on 2SSR 99.7 FM, Sound of the Sutherland Shire. When I announced that you were coming back on the show, we invited our listeners to throw some questions our way. And one of the questions we received from Pat Simmons was, who are your favourite authors? <laughs> Have you got about four hours? Um, no, we've got about 14 minutes, actually. <laughs> no, um... Look, it's like food. I couldn't possibly give you my 10 favourite foods because there are so many different sorts of foods and it's the same with books. Um, okay, all right, I'll show okay. that for um, you. Mary, to... Mary Grant Bruce, Ma Ma Margaret Axwood, um, Cherry Pr Pratchett, Anne George, um, Judith Wright, um, Patrick White. Look, I could, I, could, I could go on and it depends on my mood. Right. Just as I said, I had a piece of watermelon before the show began and... Um, the equivalent of a piece of watermelon with with a story. Then, okay, um, I was going to say, how about we make it easy for you? You're, you're going, you're stranded on a desert island. What one book have you saved from your sinking ship? Um, no, I think on the desert island, I take the National Library with me, <laughs> with cafe um, <laughs> and bathroom, and then I'd be very happy. I think. <laughs> okay, all right, that's that's okay. That's that's a good answer. Okay, all right. <laughs> Otherwise, what, what, whatever collection um, is the largest book. Um, preferably one I could float onto my desert island, I think. A book which would make a very, very good raft. All right. Now, what advice would you give to any children who are listening to the show today who want to be an author when they grow up? I know you've given advice to the, the grown-ups out there. Mm. What about the children? Right. Um, write as much as you can. You need to probably write at least 10 million words before you become a professional author, and the sooner you start writing them, the better. Don't worry at this stage about finishing your books because your ideas um, are maturing so quickly as you grow up that um, you're probably going to be going for different stories and different stories. So until you're 13 or 14 anyway, you probably won't want to finish a book. But if you do, that's fine too. But if you feel like moving on to something else, then you're ready to move on to something else. But write about what you love, write about what you're fascinated with. If you are fascinated with hamburgers, write about hamburgers. After all, lots of people make their living writing about food. Write about what interests you, but also think. The most beautifully written book in the world would be boring if it's got boring ideas. Someone who wants to be a professional writer, the most important thing for them to have is fascinating ideas. And there are quite a lot of bestsellers out there that are actually appalling writing. I mean, they are really, really, really so bad. You're almost embarrassed. In fact, you are embarrassed, but you read them anyway because the ideas are fascinating and what's happening in the story is absolutely fascinating. So it really is more important to have those ideas than write well. But if you can, write well too. So think, observe, imagine, create, and write. I will. Thank you. Two On our last show, Jackie mentioned her award-winning award book, Pete the Sheep, was hitting the stage. Well, it has hit the stage. It hit the stage Monday, 31st of March. Sorry, on 31st of March. I don't know if that was a Monday, but anyway. And now you can see Pete the Sheep, the musical, at the Monkey Bar Theatre, Lend Lease Darling Harbour. Darling Quarter Theatre. There's a 50-minute musical and it's running until 24th of April and is suitable for children 4 to 9 and, of course, the adults. For more information, you can visit www.monkeybar.com.au and that's bar B double A. Jackie, you're also the patron of the Monkey Bar Theatre Company. Yes, and look, they, they're sheer magic. Um, every production I've seen of theirs is incredible. They're the only theatre company that I know of that takes only Australian works of literature and turns them into productions, not just on the stage, but then they workshop them with kids and then they take them around Australia, though so they've um, started taking um, productions to the USA as well um, during there. And look, I knew what they would do with Pete the Sheep would be extraordinary. 
but I had no idea it would be as brilliant. Um, I was sitting next to a very sophisticated 14-year-old who really did not want to be there. And within 45 seconds, he had just dissolved into giggles and he decided afterwards that, yes, in fact, he really did like musicals and he really did like the theatre and he thought he didn't. Um, it's possibly the funniest thing I've ever seen and it's only when you go away you realise that you missed the bits that were just incredibly deep and moving because you were laughing too much. It's about the right to be different. It's about how wonderful it is to sometimes be different from other people or other sheep. It's more than anything, though, it's about standing by your mates um, and, and, and working together, um, being there for each other, whether, whether you're a sheep or a dog or a shearer. And some parts of it were just so moving. So I've seen it twice. And Brian and I really want to see it again at least several times because, as I said, you laugh so much all the way through it that it's only afterwards you realise, hey, wait a minute, that was just that that was wonderful. I have to see that again and see how they did it. It's just it's just extraordinary. All right. For more information about Pete the Sheep the Musical, as I said, www.monkeybar.com. Dot au and Jackie, we were going to ask you to read Pete the Sheep for us. If you, if you want to get ready for that, because I think we've got like nine minutes left. I've now. got I've got it here in front of me now. Okay, Jackie, do you want to read us uh, some of Pete the Sheep? Okay, Go stop for me, it. stop me when we've had enough. Okay, okay. Retsu the Shearer had a sheepdog called Baruch. <laughs> Big Bob the Shearer had a sheepdog called Tiny. <laughs> Bungo the Shearer had a sheepdog called Fang. But the new Shearer had a sheep sheep. Hi, I'm Sean, he said, and this is Pete. Bah, said Pete politely, which in sheep talk means, Hello, delighted to meet you. Madam, please step this way. You can't have a sheep sheep, cried Big Bob. Why don't you get a proper sheep dog, yelled Ratso. Throat, muttered Bungo, who never said much. Pete's as good as any sheep dog, said Sean. We just do things differently. Bah, said Pete, which in sheep talk means... If you don't mind waiting, sir, Sean will be with you shortly. That's Sean to the other sheep. Sean and Pete were a great team. Sean was a sensational shearer. And the sheep really liked Pete. And by the way, on the page, this is a sheep getting a really cool calf. Bah, bah, asked Pete. Yes, you're right, said Sean. I do need to take a little more off around the ears. Well, we do things properly in this shed, yelled Ratso. Go bring in some sheep, brute! <laughs> Hurry up, Tiny, called Big Bob. <laughs> yep, agreed Bungo, who never said much. <laughs> but the sheep didn't move. They were waiting for Pete. That sheep sheep is nothing but a troublemaker, yelled Ratso. He has to go, cried Big Bob. Too right, shouted Bungo, who never said much. If Pete goes, I go, said Sean. That suits us fine, yelled the other shearers. What will I do now? Sean asked sadly. I love shearing. Bah, Pete said comfortingly. You're right, Pete, said Sean. At least I still have you to shear. First, Sean shore Pete's front and back legs. Then he shore Pete's neck and middle. Then he took off Pete's hat and gave him a whole new walk. When Pete showed it off to all the other sheep, they were amazed. Bah, 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 they exclaimed excitedly. Where did you get that cool cuss? Bah, 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 bah. Which gave Pete 
an idea. Sean's ship salons and Baba. Their first customer was very happy. So was the second. And so was the third. And you now have to imagine sheep with the most incredible haircuts. Soon everyone was talking about Sean's sheep salon. News of their success spread quickly. Before long, Sean and Pete had so many customers, they couldn't look after them all. The other shearers were furious. It's not fair, said Ratso. We're the ones who have proper sheepdogs. Too right, agreed Big Bob. He looked around. By the way, where are our dogs? Gone to get a trim. Love Brute, Tiny and Fang. Jumping Jumbox, look what I just found, roared Bungo, which was more than he usually said in a week. The shearers raced into town. The three dogs had crept sheepishly into the salon. Woof, asked Brute hopefully. Woof, agreed Tiny. Grrrr, added Fang, admiring a sheep Sean had just shorn. I'm really sorry, apologised Sean, but our salon is for sheep only. Bah, 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 Pete said firmly. Jackie, sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> I'm really enjoying your story and I'm watching the clock and I'm thinking, please stop ticking clock, please stop clicking. We've got two minutes until our next show, the Macedonian show is coming on. That's wonderful. And if you'd like to see Pete the Sheep, the musical, as I said, you can contact the Monkey Bar Theatre, www.monkeybar.com.au. Are you an emerging author or illustrator? Are you serious about taking that next step on your creative journey? Why not visit the creativekidstales.com.au website? There you can find a full, there you can have a full author or illustrator profile, including displaying your work, networking with others. You'll also find useful tips such as comprehensive publishers listing, writing tips, competition information, author interviews, book reviews, and loads more. Visit the Creative Kids Tales website today. What are you waiting for? Creativekidstales.com.au. Jackie, here we are again, and I have still many more questions. I want to talk to you about your beautiful garden. Uh, I, I, I won't be as rude to ask you back for a third time, but we will talk to you again in the future. I've been chatting with Jackie French today. Her website, if you'd like more information, is www.jackiefrench.com, and we will have this podcast available on our SoundCloud uh, account very very shortly well that's about it for another edition thank you Jackie for being so generous it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show again thank you for being so gracious with your time no an, an absolute complete pleasure to be on the show thank you all right thank you very much don't forget this week's giveaway for your chance to win a copy of pennies for Hitler by Jackie French visit our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the author shelf and tell us why you would like to win a copy. We'll pick up two winners. We'll pick two winners for our next show, which will be on Sunday, Easter Sunday, the 20th of April, where we'll chat with author, children's author, Adam Wallace. It's one o'clock. I don't even have time for a goodbye.